we have our seasonal mixes. So our seasonal mixes is something that we developed maybe two years ago, and it is a big hit. It just wow. gives these, it gives clients, you know, a different product because at the end of the day, you're offering the same thing over and over again. Yeah, that's okay. But you always have to have something different, and so with seasonal mixes, I found that it gives people the opportunity of trying something different.、Mm -hmm. And so you'll see clients buying what they usually buy plus the seasonal mix. Welcome to the Mike Green's Mastery Podcast. I'm your host Jonah Krokmalnik. Together, we'll explore the art of turning tiny seeds into a thriving microgreens empire, sharing insights, coveted secrets, and strategic wisdom from building one of Canada's largest microgreens farms. Stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations with leading figures in the world of microgreens. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's episode, we have Sam Doucet from Kind Culture in Ontario, Canada. Over the last few years, Sam has scaled his business to an impressive size, getting the absolute highest yields I've ever seen in the industry. Sam has also managed to achieve a balanced lifestyle with his business, having plenty of leisure time as well as being able to actually start a second business. We chat about the importance of persistence in getting sales, the benefits of selling to retail store customers, and the process of getting GAP certified in Canada, and so much more. This episode is jam packed with Sam's many years of knowledge in the industry, and I'm really excited for you guys to listen in. So let's get right into it. Thanks, Sam, for coming on the podcast. I'm really excited to have you here. We've been chatting for for years now, and this is the first time we're having, you know, at least a virtual face to face. So it's really great to have you on the podcast. I'm really excited for people to hear about you and your company. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me, man. I'm really excited. Awesome. So I'd love to hear how you first got interested in microgreens, and then kind of how the backstory of your company, Kind Culture, came to be what it is today. Yeah, for sure. So it's funny in college, I was really into、uh, wanting to start my own business. So I, I created this entrepreneurial club、uh, for like-minded people like myself, and we were talking about、uh, growing food indoors this one day. And so I started doing a market research, and in that research, I found what microgreens were, and I found that the startup cost was next to none, and also the learning curve wasn't that steep. I mean. There's you always learn some stuff along the way, but I mean to start, it's it's not it's not that complicated. So I found that that was pretty interesting. I saw an opportunity in the market, and so I jumped in, started doing that at home in my one bedroom apartment、uh, next to my washing machine. And it's funny because、uh, in the laundry room, it kind of smells like whatever like the detergents you have.、Yeah. And it's funny that microgreens kind of. Pick up on the sense that they're around, so it kind of tasted like Tide for some、oh, reason. Oh wow! Like, like my first batch, was, yeah, yeah, it was super weird. So I moved that out of there eventually, and I started giving it out to you know people that I knew, and I saw there was a big interest, and so that's how I kind of dove in into microgreens, and I opened、uh, Kind Culture maybe six months after I started growing them at home, and、uh, I found a space、uh, that was super cheap. A、uh, thousand square foot space, and I kind of just DIY'd it、uh, until、uh, I made it happen. Amazing! What、yeah. year did you start the the farm? Twenty seventeen. Twenty seventeen. Amazing. Yeah, in July. In July. Okay, cool.、Yeah. And and people may not know,、uh, but you guys are a quite a large scale migraines farm.、Um, <laughs> what 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 kind of production level is that? Because I, I I didn't we didn't even talk about this when we had a phone call recently. What、yeah. like I don't even know what what kind of production levels are you guys at now? Um, we do about like three thousand pounds a month, roughly. Uh, in amount of、uh, everybody kind of measures it differently, right? So yeah, yeah. I'd say in amount of trays per week. It's hard to say, man. Maybe eight hundred, nine hundred trays a week. And yeah. Like, I know for a fact that me and you, we we kind of grew our stuff differently. Yeah, like I, I I grew it bigger and longer, and I think you guys did it like、uh, like bigger leaves and smaller stem. But also, I think our target market was a bit different too. So we were like we're not in we're not in restaurants or if if our stuff is in restaurants is because it's one of our clients who are food、uh, like、um, 
vegetable and fruit distributors that actually bring it to the restaurants, but we yeah. don't deal directly with restaurants. We really focus on retail, supermarkets, and grocery stores. Yeah, That's yeah, for sure. And people might think, oh, there's uh, there's only one way to, to do things, but it really depends on your market, what you're trying to achieve. So my guess is like cost is a more important metric than uh, than than anything else because of the grocery store. There's like so many levels of uh, of, of, of like markup that need to be made to make it profitable. So you guys have to have a low enough price point. Is that kind of like, cause you guys have much higher yields, I think, than, uh, most people probably do because of the density yeah. you plant in. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we perfected, um, how much we do, like depending on the microgreen, how much uh, seeds we put per tray. So let's say like broccoli, we'll put I don't know, like 35 to 30 grams of seed. And that's pretty much the max before we start seeing like wilting and problems with the yeah. growing. So, you know, we've really maxed out everything. And on, on a tray of, of broccoli, we're yielding maybe 550 grams a tray. <laughs> that and, is insane. Yeah, that's insane. It's also, look, look, it's not just the grower, it's a lot of the seed. So there's a lot of research that has been done of where we procure our seeds. Um, and we prefer different supplies for different seeds. So I'll give you an example. Our pea shoots that we use are called, uh, um, what's it called? Speckled peas from mums. Yeah. And we found that those are the highest yielding and the less problems yeah, for peas. For sure. And mums were, were like, they have their own farmer just for peas. Yeah. And their only client is mums for them. And so I think they kind of perfected how they do their peas, how they grow them to have the best quality microgreen peas. Yeah. And with those, we can see, like we harvest, I don't know, 1100 grams a tray of peas. Wow. And, and if you look at our mixes, most of our mixes are based on peas. Yeah. just because they have so much weight and they cost the cost is so low um the way i kind of i i saw that when i was looking at the market especially if i compare myself to uh producers of salads when they did mixes they already ha always had a base and so i had to find a base and i think peas was the best thing and so from there we kind of add different microgreens for different mixes yeah and so that's how we can streamline our products to have the same amount of, you know, every pack is the same amount of weight and is the same amount of, you know, you're not spending more on radish than you are yeah. on peas. It's always the same price. It's just, we're making less on some products and we're making a lot more on others. So it kind of just balances Evens out. out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's, uh, that, that's the approach I took as well. I think that's in my opinion for retail, the right approach because mm -hmm. You don't want the consumer to be at the store and be looking and being like, okay, this one's $5.99, this one's $5.49, this one's $4.99, this one's $5.69. And like, it makes it a lot more complicated for them to decide. So there's the psychology of like, they can pick and choose whatever product they prefer. It's all the same price. It keeps it simple. And that's what I see generally speaking in most retail products. It's pretty rare uh, or it's less common to see different price points for different products. It's much more common to see like you have a product line of like 15 different juices and they're all the same price and some they make more on some they make less on, but on average it equals out that it meets, meets their profitability targets. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For yeah. sure. It's, 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 so when I started in 2017, um, I was like, even before I started, I was looking a lot, uh, on videos with Curtis, um, Curtis Stone. So he yeah. had a bunch of videos out in, in, back then. And I kind of based myself on what he was doing. And so that's that's how I started. I, I started with uh, sunflowers, peas, and radish because he was saying it was the best sellers. And I mean, I guess in his market, that's that was the case. And I yeah. mean, here's, it was so and so. But the thing is, is I was targeting, you know, restaurants because there was a bigger profitability when we're talking about margins of profit. Um, but the, the thing is that I found with chefs is because they change their menu uh, often enough that you also have to change your microgreens and, and some stuff that they want, you can't really streamline a production because some stuff takes four weeks, some stuff takes three weeks or two weeks yeah. to grow. And so it's very difficult to plan out your production, especially when 
you have stuff lined up for a certain client or different clients, and then they all want to switch to something else that you don't have. So first of all, you have to go buy the seed, do, do the research, buy the seed, and then grow it and hopefully successfully. But, you know, I found it very difficult at, at, at the beginning. And I'll say within three months, I was ready to quit. But I kept on going uh, for another year. I told myself another year. And then if nothing kind of breaks through, then I'll, I'll, I'll let it go. And um, but meanwhile, you know, I kept knocking on doors and I'd say 95 percent of people always said no. Um, they weren't interested in microgreens and it was it was very difficult on my ego. But uh, I think with pep perseverance, I, uh, I definitely caught some breaks. I got kind of lucky, but at the same time, I kind of worked for it. So one of my, our, our biggest clients right now took me a year and a half to get into their stores. But that's because by the end, every week, I'd go there twice, twice a week with my price, my price list. And I always talk to the same guy. And I think he was kind of uh, sick of seeing me there. <laughs> but, I mean, especially right, right? You really want to get in the, in, into that yeah. store. So you kind of just, you don't stop until you get in. That's the way I see it. Um, unless, you know, they kind of <laughs> sue you for harassment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just got lucky because one back then in 2018, one of our biggest competitors was uh, Greenville Microgreens. And they, they shut down because of Listeria problems. And it, it just so happened that in, in like all these different stores, I had gone to them so many times that my name was on top of the list. So I had yeah. four of the biggest um, um, grocery chains call me all on the same day. It was in October. I forget the date, but it was in October. I know, I know. exactly. Like a two yeah. hour window. Like <laughs> Sobeys called me, Metro called me, Farm Boy called me, and Loblaws called me. But obviously, like I'm not, I wasn't big enough back then. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I remember that. that. That was a very unique time in uh, in, in local microgreens history in, in, in Ontario. Is like I had the same thing where like uh, so many customers that you know I tried to sell to all of a sudden are calling within like you said like a, the same day or within a couple mm -hmm. of days, and and it was just very interesting. Uh, the unfortunate challenge that we had is uh, we were at capacity by the time that happened, so we couldn't take on any of those customers at that time. So um, but luckily, like it was such a big gap that was left because they were like Greenbelt Migrants, which I'm hoping to go visit them in the next few weeks because uh, they're doing like all sorts of cool stuff with with uh, automation, just more with lettuce now yeah. um, is is uh, is that like they were so big. They were I believe they were the largest uh, like seller of microgreens or producer of microgreens in retail stores in the world at the time. So they, they were they were massive. They were in B.C. Yeah, and Washington huge. State. New York, Huge. like, they, they, yeah, so it left a big gap for a lot of people uh, to create opportunity. And it really just came down to it. A, a, a lot of it was timing. But in, in your case, I love that you went like twice a week for like a long period of time. It just shows like, if you don't give up, uh, how much success you can have, because I think a lot of a lot of the uh, challenges I see people have is they'll do something for a couple months, or a year or something, and then be like, mm, it's not working. And, you know, I, I was at that point with my business where, like, I thought, you know, how am I going to make this work um, until I did start doing cut product, which is what really changed things. But, like, it's the perseverance that you kept doing the same thing that you knew would work uh, eventually, and eventually it did. And um, and I think it's just a, a good lesson for people on, like, you know, you, you're, you, you're producing uh, 800 trays or roughly per week, but you're actually producing a lot more product because your yields are so high. Like, you're getting, like, 3x the normal broccoli yield or you know e even pea shoots is higher than um uh any anywhere else i've heard getting a yield like that so um i think you're producing a lot more than you might be giving yourself credit for um <laughs> but point being is like the perseverance i think is is a, a really good lesson for people in um in this business or really any business yeah yeah for sure it's 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 not like, look, you see all these videos online on, on how, hey, like, just set up a rack and make like a thousand bucks a week. Um, it's a little bit more than that, right? I think it's a great side hustle. If you're serious about making a business out of it, it takes a lot more effort and a lot more time. You can definitely do it out of your own house and get a couple clients. I'm not like, I'm not against that. It's obviously difficult to compete against people like that. And you see it in the um, 
you know, more in restaurants. So when you go, like I've already went to restaurants and like, oh, we're getting supplied by so and so from around the corner. Yeah. And these are the prices. And I'm like, for me, if I priced it like that, I wouldn't make any money. Like, yeah. it doesn't make any sense for me. So yeah. I, like I said, I saw a big opportunity in the retail market. And at the time I was, I forget who it was, somebody in the States I was following and, and this guy's like, he had tried in restaurants and, and food distributors and he's like, it's not working. So he kind of just focused on retail and he grew his business like crazy. And so mm -hmm. I'm like, here in Canada, there's back then there was just green belt microgreens. So I'm like, shit, like there, there's a whole big empty spot for another producer because I'd go into stores and nobody really had microgreens back then. Yeah. Yeah, no, they're, they're, they're like, I, I think the, the restaurants or, or food service side is um, easier to get into, but it's, and, and generally it's more like, I, generally speaking, it's more profitable, maybe not in your scenario where like someone was, was just producing it so inexpensively because they're doing yeah. it from their house. Um, but generally like I've seen the food service, you can get better margins, but they're often more difficult crops or more expensive crops to grow like basil, cilantro, amaranth, the things that are more popular are also more of a challenge to grow. And then on the retail side, they're generally the easier crops to grow, like the pea shoots, the sunflower, broccoli, um, radish, etc. So, um, I'm glad you, you, you found the market that made sense for you. And I agree, like my business grew uh the last you know five years of it mostly from retail like we, we we scaled up with food service first and then we went into retail and retail uh was one a lot in a lot of ways a lot easier once you're in i feel like getting in is hard as in your experience but once yeah. you're in retail stores it's like smooth sailing it's like you're uh, sailing a ship in the Caribbean instead of the North Atlantic with big storms. So it, it's a lot easier once you're in, but to get in, you got to go through those storms in, yeah. in the North Atlantic to get to the Caribbean. So it, it's, uh, it, you know, there's different benefits and disadvantages. Um, but I, I, I totally understand where you're coming from is that like chefs require a lot more work from you. Uh, and in doing this podcast, I realize a lot of people really love that. Um, I've noticed a lot of farms really enjoy working with chefs and having that close connection. Um, but from a pure business perspective, you know, the, there's a the, like the retail is easier to, you know, you're spending less of your time to run the business working in retail or selling in retail stores than in uh, to restaurants or the chefs. Yeah, it's it's a volume game or it's a margin game. That's what it is. Yeah. And if I went. I went the, towards the volume just because it, for me, it made sense. It's more volume I have, the better prices I get for all the stuff that I'm buying. Yeah. And so with time at first, it's super expensive, but like now it's been almost seven years and like I have the lowest prices I can imagine on all the stuff we have, either whether it's seed or packaging or labels or, or just cardboard boxes, like anything that we purchase is now so cheap because we have that the volume for it. Yeah. So I think in the end, on the long run, going retail, you just get more money out of the product that you're growing. Plus, I find that you get better, like personal and, 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 and professional balance in your life on when you're working and when you're doing what you want. I can't imagine um, running a business, dealing directly with chefs and having the lifestyle and the liberties that I have right now. Um, going retail really allowed me to have more employees and with more employees, I can get more time to myself to do whatever I want. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's something that um, well, I was very happy to hear when, when we had our phone call uh, last week was like how little of your time is needed to run the business at this point, which I think is, is, is really cool. And something that I think most people are striving towards when they're running their microns business because they see that it often at the beginning can be seven days a week and they want to at least transition to have like a more normal life balance and then eventually to get where you're at where like, you can run other businesses and do other things and and uh and yeah and just have like a better lifestyle as an entrepreneur uh, just owning a microns business instead of having to run one daily so i would love to hear how you kind of made that transition happen it sounds like retail was part of it um yeah. But in terms of like managing staff and ensuring that your time is 
only done, uh, only used for the most important tasks in the business and how you kind of structured the business so that you don't have to be there all the time. Okay. Yeah, uh, for sure. So I'd say it wasn't easy getting where I am. Uh, it took me at least five years. And when I say it wasn't easy, I'll, I'll give you an example. My longest week was 120, well, almost 120, I think it was 118 hours in one week. And so that week I did three overnights where I didn't sleep. And then wow. the following week I was sick, obviously, because I mean, you can't operate yeah. <laughs> you can't operate like that, but you just had to do what had to be done. So I'd say the first five years I missed a lot of Christmases, yeah. um, a lot of New Year's, birthdays, holidays. Uh, I'd see my friends go on vacation while I was working, uh, just the weekends. Like I was always working weekends. I'd see my best buddies going golfing, uh, going on trips, going, I don't know, RVing, camping, whatever. And, um, the way I got through it is five years for the next 15. That's always the way I thought is five years sacrifice for the next 15 of whatever I want to do. And yeah. that's exactly what happened. So. The amount of effort I put in paid off in the end. And the way I structured it is I put, like I said, because I'm in retail, I can have better pricing and I can have more employees. More employees mean more responsibilities, responsibilities that I can give away to them. And so I have two very amazing full times and they have a bunch of responsibilities in production. And so if production is taken care of, all that's rest for me is everything that has to do with client development, new projects, and just like the clients we have right now, just keeping them happy yeah. and make sure that our products are getting out to them in a timely, timely fashion. And so by doing that, I can basically work from anywhere now. I can work from my home, I can work on the road, I can work from the office. It doesn't really matter where I am because I'm always in contact with my two employees that are here on, on full time. Um, obviously, you can choose like I could choose to do absolutely nothing like the bare minimum come in once a week. But I mean, if you want to grow your business, that's not yeah. the way it's not the way to do it. So I could, but I'm, I don't. But it gives me the liberty of, you know, doing research, like I said, and trying to expand the business into a new direction. Uh, I think we kind of plateaued of where we are right now, especially in the Ontario market. Um, and that's why we're kind of looking forward to moving out of Ontario into maybe Quebec. Yeah. And I really, I really want to go into New, New York state. I really do. I don't know how I'm going to make it happen. I think there's a lot of research I have to look into with import exports and all the taxes and different things. Um, but that's something I'd like to do is, is, yeah. is towards that. I think the biggest market in the, in Canada would be Quebec, just the way of how people approach microgreens um, in Quebec compared to Ontario, because Ontario has the most population. But I find that I find that Quebec is just I don't know, it's just they eat different, they're more op open to new products and trying new things and incorporate new products within their diet. Yeah, and hopefully I can get my hands there. Like we're already in some stores outside of Ottawa, like in Gatineau. But I'm I'm looking towards like Montreal, towards like Montreal, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and what's what's what, from what I've seen, uh, you know, I haven't seen any large growers. Like it's it seems to be mostly smaller growers mm -hmm. in uh, the Montreal area. So you know, I haven't been to Montreal in a few years, uh, but I didn't see any like large scale microgreens growers there. So you know, with with your price point, there may be a big opportunity there. And then. Yeah, like, you know, once you get to a certain scale, like, you know, export becomes something that that, that is an option. Um, and, you know, New York State with New York City being like one of the biggest cities in the world and a pretty affluent city at that. With the Canadian dollar, there's like a huge advantage, like oh. uh, being able to compete there. Um, so it really just comes down to like the logistics of getting the product there and getting customers in that in that region. Yeah, I mean, in the States, if I keep the same price, like dollar for dollar, let's say Canadian to US, if I keep the same pricing that I sell right now, I can undercut the market and it will really shake things up. Yeah. Or, or you kind of just match the prices that are there and then you make more money. So there's two different kinds of approach. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do yet. Maybe, a you know, a happy medium would be the best, like make a little bit more money, but still be a little bit cheaper than whatever's offered there. Cause I was looking in the whole foods, they have like 30 something stores in New York around yeah. New York city in and around. 
and I think that it's pretty much just arrow farms. That's it's just arrow farms that yeah. I've seen. Yeah, yeah. And you'd be able to undercut arrow farms on pricing. Absolutely. They're, I think wow. they're selling four forty nine US, which is basically almost six dollars here. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you, I never really think about how much of a difference the Canadian US dollar is. Um, but that, that's it's a huge advantage for for um, growers in the U.S. is that they sh they can potentially buy supplies in Canada um, and, and get much better pricing because like you know clamshells if it costs fifty cents then it's like I don't know like high thirty something uh, yeah. in, in in U.S. dollars if, if you're paying in, in Canadian so um, you know advantages go both ways but yeah in, in your case I think that's that sounds like a huge opportunity um, you know. In, in that in that region but even just montreal itself um yep. is, is quite a big city and it's much more of a food culture uh like like, like you kind of said so it, it's much more like if any if anyone's never been in montreal it's much closer to europe than it is to canada in a lot of ways um <laughs> uh the food's just like much better quality and and it's a, a quite a different culture in, in some ways um but in terms of production capacity, so it looks like there's some you know opportunities uh, you know to expand in, in different capacities um, going into the future. How does your production facility look with those opportunities? Like, do you have like like the space, space to, right now? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the way I built it is so let's just say right now what we're producing in our like in our production room, we could double or even triple our production without putting any other you know money for infrastructure materials wow. or equipment um so when i built it i wanted to build it bigger to yeah. have because i know i saw how what happened when green belt closed and i wanted to avoid that at all costs again where i had to look i have a timeline i have to build up all, all this to do the production and i didn't want that so opportunities kind of arise out of nowhere and i just yeah. wanted to be ready whenever that happens that i have the space and i can tell people yeah we can produce for you and we can have that ready next week kind of thing yeah yeah that's that that's a good point and also like because microgreens are more profitable than your average crop that you grow it does give you more wiggle room to spend the money up front um and, and invest in in having a larger facility and still be profitable with that larger facility but once yeah. you like if you can triple the production in your space all of a sudden like the per unit cost for rent and heat oh, and absolutely. and taxes and everything just yeah. uh, uh goes goes into a, a like 30 becomes 33 percent. so all of a sudden you not only Sorry, produce man, more you also become them. more profitable and yeah once we fill that up i have uh the same like the same amount of space for a second production room right beside it. it's just an empty space for now but all i have to do is kind of connect our production room to our harvest room and it's basically like three walls that i have to construct and then insulate and then finish off uh with like agro plastic inside and yeah. then get get some shelving in that's it so i mean the, the cost is probably going to be really? 50 percent of what it costs for the first production room and so i can you know <laughs> i can do a lot more man in this yeah, space I yeah can really maximize what i got that's good to hear that, that it, it's good to have the uh the optionality because i think like you know especially for a lot of small farms when they're at the stage where they're in their house and they're at capacity and to take that leap to get a commercial facility can be very expensive um yeah. all of a sudden you're paying rent when you didn't pay rent your utility bills are way higher in a commercial space than they are in a home. Um, so it, it makes it a lot harder jump than where you're at, where you're just like replicating the same thing and you're already paying all those bills already and have a profitable system. So um, yeah. it's great to hear that you're that you're at that stage and you have those opportunities. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, maybe we'll have a, a chat in a few years and and I'll and I'll see I'll see your product in uh, in stores in Montreal or, or maybe even New York. That would be amazing. Yeah, yeah, that'd be nice. I mean, yeah. we'll, see, we'll see what time and time will tell. And uh, I mean, if you don't try, you won't know, right? So exactly, exactly. Um, you mentioned uh, like ha like like seeding quite high rates and getting very high yields. Um, what in my experience, when you seed that high, disease risk is like like exponentially higher. So how how do you kind of manage? Uh, I'm guessing it's mostly pythium that you're dealing with, but how do you manage disease and pests? with having such high density plantings? Make sure you have very clean trays. Honestly, clean trays, clean tables will do the world of a difference. And we saw that with 
so we, we like we made our our own we had a guy construct a uh, like a semi-automated tray washing machine and it's it has two big motors on it to have the like the biggest pressure you can get yeah. out of uh, out of the water and so when our trays are coming out they're absolutely clean and then we sanitize them um, and we saw a big difference when we added that second motor. So the first motor was okay. It was getting most of the dirt off, but you know, some, some, some roots were getting stuck. And so it's just the, the way I saw it is the cleanest you can get it, the less problems you're going to have and obviously airflow. So you need a lot of airflow to get, you know, all that humidity out of yeah. the crops. Um, and if you don't have that, that's where you'll start getting some wilt, some damping off for sure. Um, so to answer your question, look, we tested a lot, man. Yeah. And every new seed lot, even if it's the same supplier, we always get samples in maybe a month before. And we do like all these different tests like we have. So that's for every new seed lot that comes into the farm. We always test. We always plant one or two tables worth. So between 16 and 32 trays. And we have different um, seeding rates for every tray. So we see, we kind of try to see which is best for that seed lot. Even though it's the same supplier, sometimes, like you know, weather's different from one year to the other. So all yeah. the harvest, even though it's the same seed or you might get different results. That's it. For and sure. so, we, so the testing is very important to us to make sure that we can maximize the stuff without getting into any hiccups. Um, if we didn't do that, then we'd probably be shorting our clients and you don't want that. Yeah. And yeah. so it really is just testing. And like I said, it's finding the right seed supplier and, 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 and sourcing the seed, right? So like, I'd say the most difficult uh, crop for us would be sunflowers. Sunflowers yeah. are a hassle. They cost so much in time and effort, especially with the seed hauls. So if you can find a supplier that has sunflowers that can grow and shed most of the seeds by themselves, then you're saving a lot, a lot of time. But sometimes yeah. you're not lucky and you have to buy a crop. And like right now we're stuck with a crop that takes like on our Thursday harvest, which is our biggest harvest, it takes almost three hours just to de-haul sunflowers. Wow. Three hours. Yeah. Within that three hours, we can pack three or four different varieties. You know, we can pack over a thousand pounds of greens within three yeah. hours. But now you're stuck de-hauling. You know, it's just, it's crazy to me that, anyways. So, like I said. Yeah, I know, you I just, know what you mean. Yeah, you just have to find a good supplier. And, and I'd say in my personal experience, um, especially where we are, the best sunflower lots are from the States. If you can, yeah. even though it comes from a Canadian supplier, let's say like mums, um, the best lots are from the States. They're big sunflowers. So they shed their shells more easily and you can go get that ridiculous, ridiculous yield off of your tray. So like my biggest yields were probably a year and a half ago and we were yielding about almost two kilos a tray in sunflower. Wow. <laughs> You know, we have the right seed lots. That's yeah, the thing. yeah, yeah. And the way That's we grow, crazy. the way we grow them is a bit different from our other crops. So, and and I'd say every sunflower we grow them differently. So this batch is an Italian lot. So they're small seeds. Yeah, and they grow smaller. They don't shed quite as good. And to really maximize them to shed by themselves, what we do is we plant them. I think it's an, a nine day cycle. So we plant them and they only get light at the last day before they oh, get wow. Oh, That's interesting. Huh. For that crop, but yeah. other crops, they might get four, four days. Yeah, I, yeah. I've, I've seen, I've seen like, I've grown a crop that as soon as you unstack them um, and put them in tables, like they want lights right away. And that's the best yielding crop. Yeah. Some, like, but this one is if we put lights too fast, I find that Italian sunflowers stay really small. And so yeah, if you like, yeah. turn on the lights too fast, then you don't get that yield. And sunflowers are a big part of our mixes. And so that's how we go get our weight. Interesting. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. No, like if there's any takeaway people can take from the production side of things, it's like, don't be cheap 
when buying seed, like to spend the money to buy good quality seed. Now, sometimes, like you said, it may not be available or it may not be available in the volume you need. But as an example, like I always recommend people like get sunflower from Johnny's. It's yeah. Yeah. It's double the price, but you don't have to deal with all the headaches all the time. Um, so there, there, there's things you can do to mitigate some of these some of these challenges. And I highly recommend for people not to not to be cheap with the seeds. Um, like, look, I, when I started and I'm sure when you started too, you were like, where can I find the cheapest source of seed? That's the, yeah. the mindset of a lot of uh, early entrepreneurs when starting these type of businesses. Like, how can I save cost? But often saving that cost will cost you more is what I've learned. And with seed, yeah. especially like you can have the best setup, like automation galore, like really high quality soil, the best lights. If you have crappy seed, none of it's going to matter. So you really need to spend the time and effort to find and source uh and and like you said do the testing to make sure the seed is good uh, because it'll make your life so much easier oh yeah testing is crucial and look i'll give you an example last time we had a good seed lot of sunflowers i bought a metric ton yeah (laughs) right away because i don't want to screw around i don't want to miss the opportunity of having to restart um that whole process of testing this new seed lot and and having to you know switch all my production because of it yeah so if you can maintain like i know it's a lot of upfront cost i get it and you know i can we can do it now because we have so much volume going out and coming in but before i couldn't so i mean sometimes you just got got to bite the bullet and i know cash flow is a big thing especially in farms and especially in microgreens Uh, but if you can and like do it you have to do what you have to do, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. I, I, we have a lot of the same mindset on a lot of things. And that's one thing with Sunflower. Once I found a good lot, I was like, I'm buying at least a year's supply, um, you know, to, to ensure that I don't have to do this testing every few months because it sucks. Like, and, and it's, it's not even just the testing. It's like you have to grow it differently it's in, certain, in certain aspects to get it to uh, yield and or result in the same seed uh, shed hauling or whatever yeah. it may be. So it, it's definitely work to, to grow sunflower. And if you can find a good seed lot, it's well worth it to pay to, to, to have supply for a while. Uh, but as you said, like cash flow can sometimes be an issue, especially at the beginning. And uh, when you're just starting out, it doesn't necessarily make sense to do that because you don't know how much production you're going to do. So yeah. you don't want to buy like a metric ton if you're just starting out as an example. But because you know your production at this point, it makes sense to buy a large amount because you know you're going to use it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting what you said, you know, when you said you don't know your production, so you can't really forecast what you're buying. But so that's another reason why when it went into retail, because retail is mostly the same every week. Yeah. Um, and restaurants are just different every week. And so it's very, like I said, it's very hard to plan your production. But when you are in supermarkets and retail stores, it's so similar that you can always, always grow the same amount of stuff for the same client because every week you'll order probably the same thing. Most likely it it just, it kind of fluctuates with the like holidays and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not talking about just, you know, Christmas and new years, you know, the big holidays, like, um, Thanksgiving is a big one. Um, there's also one in, uh, I forget, uh, in April Easter. or something. Yeah, Easter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Easter is another big one. And so we can see that right before the holidays, our orders go way up and then fall down and then come back to normal. Yeah. It's always the same thing. So that first year is always difficult and you either waste or you're short. But now, because we know all the trends with our clients that we have, and we've had had them for six years now. And so, you know, we can anticipate um, those orders. For sure. Uh, What would you say is is the most popular products that or like the top three, let's say, uh, retail products that you sell at this point? Uh, The most popular is broccoli. Broccoli is the number one. I, I believe it's not because what it tastes and what it, it's mostly because of the research that was done on broccoli. When you look on microgreens or health or whatever on Google, the first thing is that you're going to see is microgreens and broccoli. Yeah. And I think it's just, it's the way it happened. Somebody out there, when they started doing studies on microgreens, they just chose broccoli. And so broccoli has a ton of information out there. And I think every microgreen has their own little benefit and, and, and that, but, um, 
I think because because of how the research was done and how Broccoli was selected first, I think that's just why yeah. people go for it. And I think it's a very familiar product, right? You go in stores, either you buy you know mature broccoli, you're used to it. You have, everybody has broccoli in their house, and yeah. so when you see a broccoli microgreen, you, you know what it is. If you see sunflower, you're not used to seeing live sunflowers. You're used to eating sunflower seeds, yeah, right? But not sunflower sprouts. There's not like a grown sunflower that you could buy and eat. But I think that's just why broccoli is one of the most popular product. And then obviously we have our mixes. So we have like a crunchy mix, which is a mix of peas, sunflower and radish. Um, and our mild mix, which is a mix of peas, sunflower, broccoli and amaranth. And then you have our seasonal mixes. So our seasonal mixes is something that we developed maybe two years ago. And it is a big hit. It just wow. gives these, it gives clients, you know, a different product because at the end of the day, you're offering the same thing over and over again. Yeah, and that's OK, but you always have to have something different. And so with seasonal mixes, I found that it gives people the opportunity of trying something different. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see clients buying what they usually buy, plus the seasonal mix because they want to try it. So we have that's smart. Yeah. So we have spring, um, summer, fall and winter mix. OK, and so we you, kind of you you rotate through them. Yeah, just like the seasons. So we'll introduce our um, summer mix probably just because of how our harvest day falls. It, it's going to be introduced the 21st of June, which is the first day of yeah, summer, which is a Friday. We do deliveries on Fridays. Yeah, I really like that. That's I've never heard of that before, but it's really smart because like um, it, it gives like especially once you're a more established farm, you've been selling the same places for many years like at some point, people are like, hey, I know what this is. Ooh, there's something new here. They may want to try that instead. So it gives people that like, ooh, wow, kind of sensation where it's like, oh, it's the summer. Like now I can get uh, Kyan Culture summer mix. And then uh, it's like something to look forward to. That's, oh, it's fall. I can get the fall mix. So I think yeah. that's really smart. I never thought of that before, but I think that's a really smart strategy to keep people, customers engaged when you're not necessarily like expanding the product line every year sort of thing, because at a certain point, there's only so many profitable microgreens that make sense to sell in retail. Um, exactly. So that, I think that's a really smart strategy to, to keep engagement and excitement uh, with your customers that are purchasing the product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. And like I said, we, we see it in the numbers. It's super, super popular. When it comes out, there's a big surge. Everybody buys that season. Uh, makes, and it doesn't die out until it stops. Like even a spring mix right now, like it's one of our biggest sellers everywhere just because it's only there for three months. Yeah, so that's really smart. Fun. I really like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Good, good insight on, uh, you know, for other people to try and, and see if they can get that to work in their local uh, areas. But I think, yeah, that, like logically it makes sense. And obviously it's working for you. So it's a good mm -hmm. strategy to, to implement for for farms, um, you know, in other regions that you know, may, may be in a similar situation as you, but just on a yeah. smaller scale. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I have to give credit where credit is due. So, I mean, like the, that idea of doing seasonal mixes, we like we had started summer mix five years ago. It's just and basically our summer mix is the mix of um, it's mums, uh, broccoli, brassica blend, I think they call it. OK. And with a mix of just um, I call it red radish. It's purple, right? Purple yeah. Radish. Um, and th that's when we started. And when we starting when we started doing more microgreens, I kind of put that on the shelf of doing seasonal mixes until one of our biggest clients is like, Hey, you know what? We want seasonal mixes. I'm like, yeah, no problem. I've already thought about all the mixes I want. We didn't offer it, but I think credit is due to having those business relationships with your clients. And it's very important to, you know, um, listen to them and be open-minded. To, yeah, not, not only the clients, also to your employees. So like for me, because I'm mostly in the office right now, like for me, it's so important that I sit down with my full uh, full time staff and I listen to what they suggest of what we should be doing, because they're in it in the thick yeah. and the thin day after day, week after week. And so it's and it's funny. I don't know. You, I'm, I'm sure you probably already seen like, uh, you know, that TV show uh, Undercover Boss. No, Have you, no. OK, so it's no. these big corporate companies that, you know, the CEOs go undercover and go into their own businesses. And like, I don't know, let's say like the owner of Subway 
goes into like a subway and learns yeah. with the supervisor that's there on how to make sandwiches. And it, it, I find that most of these shows, they depict the CEOs and the owners as complete idiots because they don't know how to make it like, yeah, a sandwich, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I found that so ridiculous. And, and so when I started the business, I'm like, I'm never going to be like that. And it's funny because now since I'm more in the office, there's the little details that I forget sometimes when I go into production and my full time staff is like, we don't do it that way. Don't forget doing that. And and that's how I'm like, I can relate to this show on how these CEOs go in after so many years of not being in production anymore and being like, oh, shit, like I forget how to make a sandwich. Right. Yeah. I forget how much broccoli seeds we put in a tray It's so ridiculous. But I do forget. We also have this board, but that has like all the information that you need. But still, like I said, it's it's um, certain details you just kind of forget and it makes me feel like an idiot. But uh, that's besides the fact. Yeah, no, I, I know exactly what you mean. I feel like um, uh, that that's one of the reasons why I decided to, by the end of, of running Living Earth, still, still be there two days a week to be with the team. Because I noticed that like certain things like that, like seating rates or like how things are done when things change, I had to ask staff how to do something in my own business. And it was like very interesting. So I'm like, I have to, I feel like I, you have to be there a certain amount of the time to be with them so that you can see what's actually going on. Because uh, if, if you distance yourself too much, then it's like almost like a two stage business where you have like owner and then you have employees and there's like, there's no overlap. So you need, yeah. you need that, that overlap, especially at a smaller business. Of course, like if you have a thousand employees in some mega corporation, like the CEO can't be interacting with all the employees, but no. when you're a, a, a still relatively small business and you, you know, you have relationships with your staff, it's, I think it's good to be there. Even if you don't have to be there at a certain point, just to keep, uh, uh, keep that kind of those relationships going, but also to like, make sure you're on the ball with like knowing how things are actually done. Cause if you don't yeah. know how things are done, then it's like, how do you, how, how are you able to make good decisions on how to improve the processes in the business? Exactly. And I think the yeah. best days to be there with your staff is on harvest days. Exactly. For me. For yeah. Me. No, same. I was, I was there harvest day. That's when everyone's there. That's when everyone's yeah. there. Everyone's working hard. It's the most intense days of running a microgreens farm is, yeah. is harvest days, harvest and packing days. Um, so yeah, that, those were the days that I was there. Uh, so yeah, like I said, without even knowing these things, like we just have the same mindset on, on, uh, on how to do things. Yeah. Yeah, um, right. awesome. <laughs> if, if you could like, of, of all the things you have solved, there's always, there's always things within a business that are still unsolved or challenges that, that you deal with. Um, I, I wish there was like an end point where there's no more challenges, but it's just, that's, you know, just life and, and running a business. Is there any um, specific issues that you f you find that you're still dealing with that you would love to have a solution for? Um, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's hard to say. There's not like one this one problem, right? There's, and, and like you said, it's a business. So there's always things moving, uh, parts moving within the business. And the problem kind of arise just by itself and then you either fix it or you don't, or you move on. Um, I mean, it's always, I think it's always hard to keeping your costs low. So it's always like a fight with your suppliers to not get those, you know, those increases. Increases. Yeah. Yeah. Those increases. Like, I, I think I don't mind sharing numbers for that. Like, I, I think I've done a good job of keeping my price low until I meet this one person who's probably going to say, well, I get it lower than you, but <laughs> Like for packaging, like I've managed to get my packaging back down. Like when I started, my packaging was like 21 cents a pack. And then COVID happened and it went yeah. up to like 45. Yeah. And then I had to fight my way down and I got it down to, I think it's, I think it's 23. Really? It's, yeah. It's $46 wow. for 200. Yeah. It's 23. Wow. I That's fought crazy. It, yeah, it took yeah. Me, it me three months, three months of cost, constant bitching. And I hate doing this, but like pinning suppliers against suppliers, like shopping in different areas and saying, yeah. like, Hey, look, like if you want my business, like this person is doing it at this price, like you have to be better than that. Yeah. It sucks. it sucks doing that. I hate doing that. That's part of a job I don't like. 
but you have to do it if you want to keep your costs low. It's like um, my cardboard boxes that we use because we pack our things in, in six in cases of six. Yeah. And so the case, like the, the boxes were about 50 cents each before. And I found this supplier and th again, through pinning suppliers against suppliers, like I've managed to bring it down to 30 cents. Of, uh, wow. Um, wow. Box. That's incredible. Yeah. These, these are things that um, like with scale that you, you start getting more influence in that, like they don't want to lose your business because it's not insignificant anymore. Whereas like yeah. if you try to yeah. do that and you're buying exactly. one, one box of clamshells, they're going to, they're just going to like, you know, not, not, nothing's going to happen. But if you're buying like, you know, a ridiculous amount, like, like, a, like a couple skids a week, you know, or, or more of, 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 of different, whatever it is, whether it's soil or, um, uh, clamshells or labels or whatever, you have more purchasing power. Um, I, I don't think I ever negotiate that much, but like during COVID, it was really just about getting supply. Like if you, if you couldn't get supply, you couldn't operate the business. So I remember that was a big challenge during COVID. It's like, it didn't matter what the price was. We need yeah. this product to keep going. But post COVID now that things have, have settled back down, it's great to hear that people uh, have the opportunity to start negotiating on price because they, yeah, it's crazy how much plastic went up and soil went up. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think seed less so, but, you know, like some, some of these things went up proportionally a lot more than everything else. And, um, and if you can, you know, negotiate your way to get better pricing that allows you to sell your product at a lower price, uh, which benefits the end consumer that's buying it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, do you want to just give me a second? Um, uh, you're cutting out a lot and I'm pretty sure it's all the cameras that are on the Wi-Fi that are sucking all sure. the uh, internet. Yeah, we can pause. Yeah. Right I'll unplug yeah. them and I'll be right back. All right. Nice. Yeah, no, I think I think uh, your internet might be a little on the slow side because just the upload on your end is is uh, quite low. So hopefully that'll that'll fix it. Um, yeah, but the, just, uh, it's the downside of being out here in the boonies. Yeah. So yeah, I, 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 it, it's so funny because I live a minute from here. Okay, and we have five. Uh, which is basically high speed yeah. internet. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So people understand what five is here in Canada. Yeah. So we have a 1.5 gig download upload. Oh wow! And you know it's not that expensive. It's, I think it's like a hundred, hundred bucks, and plus plus tax. Um, <laughs> but here at the business, the five is just at the end of the driveway, and Bell, because Bell is Bell. Um, they said it would cost us six hundred and fifty dollars a month to have it. Wow! And it's literally a hundred feet from the building. That's crazy. You might as well just get Starlink at that point. <laughs> yeah, if we actually have a Starlink satellite, but we don't use it. Uh, okay. Um, it, like, it, I think it's what one hundred fifty bucks, and it kind of pisses me off because in Quebec, uh, a couple months ago, one of my employees lives there so he got his subsidized so the um like the materials the equipment didn't cost anything and then quebec covers 50 dollars a month really? forever yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of especially for farms there's a lot of benefits of oh being in quebec. my god yeah, yeah there's nothing here man yeah, in yeah, Ontario, I know, I know. It's crazy it's crazy there i haven't seen a grant from cap in years for for farms oh. other than like beekeeping or like you know a few yeah. a few things about like species invasive species or stuff like that it's crazy like it, i'm shocked at how little funding there is 
uh, the yeah. last few years. Like there's been nothing. It's crazy. Anyway, we, we'll, get, we'll get back into it. Just, just a few more questions and then we'll be, we'll be good. Um, in terms of like production or, or your time running the business, what do you find is like the most time consuming or resource intensive task uh, in your operations? Uh, the most time consuming, <laughs> probably sunflowers, man. When it comes <laughs> to production, like it's so much time, it's like unprofitable doing sunflowers. But like I said, it, they put on so much weight and they have this yeah. great team. Personally, it's my favorite. My favorite microgreen is sunflowers. Uh, they kind of, they taste good. I kind of eat them like chips at home. Um, don't get me wrong. I love chips, so I'll eat yeah. chips. But I mean, like, and sometimes I'll just take a bag of sunflowers home and I can just eat it like that. Yeah. Um, no, like, there's nothing really super difficult. I, I think I pretty much streamlined everything in the business because before COVID, uh, we were doing like 28 different varieties. Wow. And what I did is, like I said, streamline everything. It's just like, okay, what are the crops that take eight to 10 days to grow? And now I have them. I think it's like seven, seven or eight crops that we do. It's sunflowers, broccoli, um, radish, mustard, amaranth. And then, then you have like seasonal stuff. So like we grow beets in the fall. Uh, and then in the uh, winter time, we have cress. And um, I forget the other one. And then in spring right now, and see, that's what's funny. These are the things that I should know like this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I'm not in production as much, I just, I forget, uh, which is crazy to me. But anyways. Um, you got so, other, other things to, to, to deal with and other things yeah. to, to, wor to work on. So it, it, it's it, it's reasonable from my perspective. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like, so like I said, we, we grow maybe like seven uh, different varieties, but out of those seven, we make 12 different products. Oh, wow. So with okay. the mixes. Okay. And are yeah. all of those 12 products in retail stores? Uh, no, no. Uh, part of those 12, there's four that are seasonal. So there's oh, seasonal, always yeah. one, right? one of them that's in rotation. Yeah. And, uh, and usually like if I look, look, I'll just take a look at my order sheet. I think it's 10 products that we do. Retail. Uh, pretty much. Yeah. Constantly. Yeah. So one, two, three, four. Yeah. 10. 10. Yeah. yeah. Cause we don't, we don't offer amaranth like, yeah. like standalone in stores cause it doesn't make sense to sell that. Yeah. Um, but amaranth, we do sell it to, uh, a couple of our fruit and dish and vegetable distributors that end up at foods like restaurants, I'm guessing. Not restaurants directly, just like food, like uh, vegetable and fruit distributors, like. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you do you know where is it? Or do they sell to restaurants? Oh yeah, they sell to restaurants. Yeah, yeah. But I have yeah. no idea which who restaurants. Has yeah, yeah. Our products and who, who yeah, doesn't. no, for sure. But uh, yeah, because I was like, I, I I've never heard of Amaranth on its own at retail, so I was just assuming that it would be in uh, end yeah. up at a restaurant on a dish as a garnish somewhere where it yeah, is. Yeah, who yeah, knows? Sure. But. Yeah, yeah. For sure. It's in a restaurant somewhere. Uh, I, it's funny. Um, we have a spa right outside of Ottawa. It's one of the biggest spas, I think, I personally think, in Canada. And uh, I went to eat there with my wife, and it was microgreens. And so I'm like, I'm like, hey, where do you get the microgreens from? And this guy's <laughs> like, oh, we get them from so and so. They're actually kind culture microgreens. I'm like, get the hell, get the hell out of here, man. Yeah. So, like, it's funny. Like, I walked in not expecting that, and it's actually my product being served in my plate, which is. It's nice. Kind of a cool feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I totally know what you mean. It's it's a very nice feeling to have that experience. Even just going in a in a in a grocery store that maybe if you work with distributors and you weren't expecting it to be there, I think is like a pretty cool experience to see your product on a shelf in and of itself. Uh, yeah. So I totally I totally get that. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, last production question, in terms of like automation. Um, what, what, what do you have, what, like, what do you find is, is that you have in place? Like you have the tray washer you mentioned. Yeah. Um, I believe you have a har uh, quick cut greens harvester from our conversations years ago. Um, are you still, are you still using that? And what other kind of automation have you found helpful in, uh, in getting the scale you're at? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we do use the, uh, greens harvester. So we have the tray washer, uh, we have a soiling machine. Um, but like I said, everything is semi-automated mm -hmm. just for the reason, because 
if you automate too much, and that's just my personal opinion, and obviously it's not coming from experience, it's most likely coming from just speculation. But I find that because everything's semi-automated, it makes your job easier, but you can still have your eye on the product and what you're doing and actually seeing it. So like watering, I was thinking of doing it like you with uh, solenoids uh, for the like the, the bows yeah. and also the drains. But at the same time, it's like, Every time we water, we get the opportunity to look at the product and how it looks like. And so I find that very um, important for us. And same thing for like this, actually the soil, I wouldn't mind so much of having it fully automated, but at the, like at the same time, you still need a person to feed the trays to the machine. To yeah. Then, right. So, um, and then the tray washer, same thing. Like I want to make sure that everything's clean. So you need those people with that machine. Same thing with the green cuts harvester. So when you're harvesting, yeah. most I'd say 95% of the trays are fine, but sometimes you'll have that wilt. And if you can get yeah. it right away, like and take it out of the production just by looking at it because you're, you know, it's semi automatic. So yeah, it's better like that for us, but it doesn't mean it's going to stay that way forever. It'll, it'll probably be fully automated in a couple of years but it's just the time that we get there and have the right employees in place. And so they know what to look for. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know what you mean. Cause like when, as an example with the quick cut greens harvester, if you have disease, uh, if you have any pythium in, in trays, you definitely don't want that to end up in the product because it's going to make everything go bad. Um, but I think like in theory, the goal would be like create a system where you don't have any disease. Now, is that possible? I don't actually know. Um, mm -hmm. But in theory, like that's what you would do. And then you don't need to have that skilled, uh, person to to push the like to check the trays as they're going through it could be mm -hmm. a less uh skilled um uh role that someone just is literally just pushing them through uh, or in theory like there's other ways we have a conveyor belt that you just put it on the conveyor belt from the tray and then it takes it all the way to the harvester um yeah. but these are like you know n not things that are necessary I, the way the way i kind of think of it um, is like, what is the return on your investment into this automation? There's like the financial return, which is how much labor savings you're having. There's like the more intang intangibles where it's like, are you getting a more consistent product because of it? Is it um, uh, easier to use like from an employee perspective? Is, as, as example, a soil mixing machine makes it much less uh, uh, tiring to fill flats when you have a machine doing it for you and just putting them in rather than mixing the soil, filling them. Uh, getting them flat, like it takes a lot more energy to do that. So like, you know, it's not something that's necessarily like a tangible benefit that you can quantify in dollar figures, but your employees will have much more energy at the end of the day and go home, come back the next day, more energized and uh, ready to tackle whatever the next tasks are. So, uh, but yeah. from a pure, uh, pure financial perspective, if it takes less than a year to pay for itself at your scale, it makes sense to do it. If it's one to three years, it probably makes sense to do it. And if it's more than, than if it's like three or five years, maybe it makes sense to wait till it's in that one to three category. That's like my methodology for yep. it. Um, do you have some, like some, something similar where it kind of helps you decide what to purchase uh, in, in making those kind of decisions? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Just like you, I means one to three. If I can't pay it off in three or make it profitable and like pay off the machine and see that I'm saving enough money so that it's worth it. Like for me, it's, yeah. like, it's like yeah. getting like when I had the crossroads of, of either buying a $40,000 harvesting or the quick greens cut. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a no brainer, right? So, yeah. um, and same thing with the washing machine. It's for, um, for tray washing. We did it for so long by, with a pressure washer by hand. It was messy. Yeah. But yeah. I just, I never had found, like, I, I still remember talking to you and, and you saying how much you spent for yours. And that was pretty much my price point. And so every time I checked and it was like 25 grand, I'm like, nope, that's too expensive. And so yeah. finally I found a guy who was willing to like, hey, I'm willing to prototype this and actually build more so I can sell. And so I, I saw that opportunity, but just like you, I think you, you partnered yourself with the, yeah. with another company that had never done it, but you got the prototype out of it. So you saved a bunch of money. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, uh, and back then there, there was uh, more grants available. So I believe we got a grant that covered like 40 or 45% of the cost, which wow. was really nice. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, <laughs> there's not as much of that in Ontario at the moment. But uh, I'm hopeful that there will be grants for farms again. And most places in North America, there are grants available pretty consistently. 
um, mm-hmm. to, to be able to cover some of the costs of like, you know, more expensive equipment. Um, one other thing I forgot to ask, which I think uh, a lot of people will, will, will love to hear is you guys are, uh, I believe, GAP certified, right? Yeah. Um, so like, how did you kind of one, I guess, make that process happen? Like, how did you get certified? And um, my understanding uh, was that GAP certification in Canada is not allowed for migraines anymore. Is that is that wrong? Uh, it, it depends of the third like the, the body of the certifying body. So like uh, um, Canada Gap will not do it anymore because they're the ones that certified green belt microgreens. And when you get a track record of having listeria outbreaks for times in a year, then it just doesn't look good. And you might as look because you have to understand that Canada Gap had the, you know, seal of approval on that company. Hey, like everything's good. Everything's good. Right. And then they get four cases within a year. And so then questions are being asked about their cert, like their certification process. And so it, it was probably easier for them to just say, like, OK, we're just shelving that. And that's a problem that we don't want to deal with anymore. Yeah. So when that happened, like the reason why we got gap is because we're at a certain point where I don't go see individual stores anymore to get into. I want to go to headquarters or head office and sit down with the senior produce buyers and figure out a way of getting our products into multiple stores at one at once is a slower process. But once, like you said, once you're in, you're in, it's just hard to get in at first. Yeah. And so most of these stores, and I'll give you an example, IGA in Quebec, you can go through back door and you don't need any certification. You could just be, Joe from across this road and just sell microgreens to that store. And there's no problem because they have an allocation, I think of 10% that they can buy local stuff. Got it. But if I want to go through head office and through the distribution network, um, I need certain certifications. And one of those is either HACCP or GAP. And some of them are probably going to start asking for, um, uh, forget the term it's anyways, it's not important, but there there's different types of certifications that you can get. So my yeah. certification under the gap is called HPSS, which is harmonized pro- produce safety. Something. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause I've heard that HACCP is like a lot more intense than, than a gap certification. It's so HACCP, HACCP, you certify the building that you're growing in. Oh, okay. And gap is a so way of, process? Well, yeah, you certify your, your product in the building, but it's mostly about traceability. That's what it is. And so how are you able to trace a product that's sold in one location and yeah. know where's your seed coming from? Where's your soil coming from? Like, when was this, you know, planted? When was this harvested? All that information needs to be available and understood. And so if there's a recall to be done, that it, it's done in the most proper and fast, fastest way possible. Yeah. And that's a lot easier than that. Like traceability is a pretty simple thing to implement compared to uh, what's required in HACCP. So it's good to hear. So, so it sounds like you, there still is gap in Canada you can get. It's just not with Canada gap. There's other certifying bodies that will provide that service. Uh, is that correct? Yeah. And it's a lot okay. more expensive because the auditors most likely come out from far away. And so they you know, there's some charges to yeah. travel time and, you know, travel expenses. Yeah. So like my, like this, the certification itself with all the fees and everything is almost two grand, but then the agent, the auditor that's coming in, depending on where they're coming from, you can spend another grand or two or three more. Yeah. And so yeah. it's a very expensive thing to have. So if you if you want to get that, it's because your goal is to get into larger supermarkets yeah. or retail stores, and you have that lined up in a way where that certification is going to pay itself within the first couple of months of you operating or having that new client. Yeah, and there's also a strategy for people that do want to go down that route of like, you know, understanding what's required. So get some basic knowledge on on Gap or if you want to do HACCP, and then approach. Uh, uh, you know, the bigger chains or stores or distributors and say, hey, I'm in the process of, of getting Gap. Once you have like some forward momentum there that there's something going to happen, uh, then maybe you can you can uh, actually get the certification or 
sometimes they, they allow like a, a, a period of time where you don't have it at the beginning, knowing that you're going to get it by a certain point. So yeah. there, there can be some flexibility there where you don't necessarily have to spend, you know, four to six thousand dollars, you know, up front to get the gap or HACCP certification. But you can um, have you can get it after knowing you have a sale ready lined up. So that's yeah. a way for for people that may not like because, you know, Four thousand dollars can be a lot of money for for some farms, um, especially at, at smaller scale, to spend on something like that without any guarantee of increasing yeah. sales. So that's a way to kind of make a middle ground uh, if you want to go that route. But it seems like, from my perspective, it seems the industry as a whole, for many years now, has been moving more towards the gap is being required. For uh, it seems like yeah. smaller and smaller kind of stores, it's going down the line. So. It is something that is required, but I'm glad to hear that Gap is still available in Canada because my understanding was, was it wasn't after Canada Gap uh, stopped certifying it. But I'm very glad to hear, even though it's expensive, that there are other options available for farms. Yeah, for sure, for sure. It's it's it took me six. So like, you have to make your own um, food safety plan. Well, when I started, so that four years ago now yeah and there's no templates available it's not like you can just download a template and fill it yeah. out and create your own so they have like critical control points there's like i don't know 170 maybe 150 points that you have to go one by one and have either um some policies uh for your business or some sheets that you're like you have to fill in for tracking and traceability and so um it was really difficult. It took me six to eight months to actually make that document. It's I don't know, like 280 pages long. Wow. wow. Um, it, but once you have it, it's easier. And now what's funny is one of the auditors um, that came over actually left like NSF. So like I, I deal with NSF that implements like the global gap um, certification. And so it's not global gap global gap created the certification and they have these control points and the auditor implementing it works for another company called nsf and so um one of my auditors left nsf and now has her own business but is still auditing for nsf and she had she has created a template for just that which is oh, that's amazing. amazing yeah because the one thing that i found that made no sense to me is that Global Gap, which is the Gap certification that that I do, has all these critical control points that you have to answer, but they have no template. So every farm they go to is different, and so different, for the yeah. auditor, the auditor has to like go through with the owner, and it takes like nine hours just to go through your stuff. Wow! And if, if you had a template, if they created a template that everybody had the same, then the, it would be more easy for the auditor to go through all the information, right? Yeah. It's just and easier to get the certification too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Was, like my first audit on 180 points, I failed 100 and probably 70. Yeah. Because I didn't know what tell I was you. Doing. They don't tell no, you. They don't tell you what. <laughs> yeah. No, exactly. It's, it's dumb. But uh, my second one, I had 35, my fourth one, I had 20, my fifth one, I had 10, and just now I had nine, nine, nine out of 80 that have to, because obviously, like, their job is to find stuff. So yeah, they have yeah, yeah. So anyways, yeah. nine, of, n nine, they call it uh, non-conformances, so nine non-conformances out of, like, 100 and something, which is yeah. really, really good. Yeah, no, I know it's the same thing with uh, organic certification is they like want to find something because otherwise it seems like they're not doing their job well, um, mm -hmm. you know, even 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 if you are following everything to a T. But that's that's great to hear. So, um, yeah, like I was I was going to suggest if anyone wants to do that, if you have the funds available, hire like a, a consultant that specializes in that sort of thing in food safety, and then they can create the plan for you and not have to spend. I don't know. I want to know how many hours you spent making that document. But um, this is kind of like, you know, uh, the same way as like, you know, 10 years ago, there wasn't much information on microgreens, how to do it the right, like uh, the most efficient way, this and that. Yeah. Now the industry is growing. So now things like gap certification will be easier to get for the next generation of farms, which I think is a good thing. Um, yeah. So I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm glad, I, glad that's available. All I want to say is if, if people contact you or get in touch with you for questions about gap, they can just reach out to me and I'll connect them with the appropriate person. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll put that in the show notes to put uh, Sam's contact for sure. Um, 
Yeah. So thanks so much for, for coming on, Sam. This has been like an amazing episode. I think lots of insight here. Uh, it's great to hear um, more about your business and, and you know, the, yep. the plans for the future and uh, and how far you've come in such a short, you know, what, seven, six years, seven years now in running yep. the business. Um, if listeners want to connect more with you or learn more about uh, Kai and Culture, where can they find you guys online and on social media? Honestly, just through Facebook, it just message us through Messenger and it, it's me. So I always have my phone on me. So I'll, I'll, I'll always answer. And, and like, I'll just put it out there. Like, I, I'm not, I like to help individuals. I don't like to put myself on a big platform and spit out information. I really love working one on one with people. And so, and I'll just give you an example. There's a vineyard close here and I get along with the owners really good. And so one of the owners, his nephew started microgreens farm in Quebec and he had joined it. They were making what, like 400 bucks a week in sales. It was like, you know, they were starting out and yeah. he had just joined them. And so he was looking for information and he was so like, he wanted to visit our farm. And so when he did, he was so surprised on how open I was on sharing information and all my, like all the information I know, I basically either got from the internet or I learned by myself. And yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not against sharing that, like, just talk to me and you have questions, I'll answer them. And so what I did with this person is I told him, <laughs> copy my business plan and do exactly what I do. I do. And you'll be fine. And so within a year he acquired and he's that this guy is a go-getter and I wish he was still in the business of microgreens because I would love to have him on my team, but he went into real estate, which is, I'm, I mean, he'll get a lot more money out yeah. of it. Um, but he was a go-getter man. Like he went to find, I think he got like over a hundred clients within a year. Wow. And he grew his, he grew his numbers. Um, from four hundred dollars a week to over seven eight thousand dollars a week in sales. Wow! Yeah, damn. And so uh, we'd have these meetings. I'd tell them what to do. Well, not tell them what to do. You know, kind of guide them on yeah, yeah. how to do things and what to grow and how to grow things. Because he was amazed on, you know, a bit like you. How are you getting all these huge yields out of your stuff? And I just told him, "This is how we do it." And so you do that, you'll be fine. And he had mixes and I told him, your mixes don't have color. They won't sell. Just put color in it. There's two colors that we use. Super simple, super easy. They're radish and amaranth. Yeah. And so that's what he started do, uh, doing and his sales went up and he went to, like I said, he's a go-getter. He went to get all, all those clients and it worked out for him. Yeah. And then unfortunately, uh, like they were three partners, they didn't get along and they all separated. And I don't know where the business is today, but. Anyways, yeah, it, it's yeah. doable for anybody. It's doable yeah. for anybody. The like, like I say this a lot, but you don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's people that that have done it, like Sam. Um, so yeah, definitely reach out to Sam if you have uh, any questions about um, the way he does things. And uh, yeah, being open book, I, I love it. I think that's that's the way of the future. And collaboration is is very powerful. So it comes back to you anyway. So um, yeah, thanks so much for coming on, Sam. Thanks for tuning in to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. To access a wealth of insights, just click the subscribe button, stay notified about each new episode, and enjoy all of this wisdom for free. If you're ready to supercharge your Microgreens business, visit microgreensconsulting.com for a gold mine of guides and resources. We've transformed thousands of Microgreens businesses, and you're invited to join the success story. Let's stay connected. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at Microgreens Consulting for exclusive content and expert tips and wisdom. If you found this episode insightful, please leave us a review, spread the word, and let's share Microgreens magic with the world. Until next time, let curiosity fuel your growth and may happiness be your harvest. Happy growing, everyone.